The aim of test, track and trace is to hunt down and isolate the virus so it's unable to reproduce. We're building an army of human contact tracers and of course we're developing the contact tracing app which can help us deliver test, track and trace on the mass scale that we need across the country. Contact tracing is one of the main pillars of the government's strategy to ease our nationwide lockdown. But how do we make sure it's effective? We need to solve the problem of how to get out of lockdown and how to resume aspects of our, our normal lives while at the same time making sure that people who are at risk of transmitting uh, the virus uh, still continue to, to self-isolate and, and quarantine. So contact tracing is one of the key tools. This is Christoph Fraser. He's the senior group leader in pathogen dynamics at Oxford University's Big Data Institute. He explained to me how contact tracing is supposed to work. You don't need to block all of the transmission to stop an epidemic altogether. You just need to be blocking enough transmission that each person is infecting less than one on average. So the question is, you know, how quick and, and how comprehensive does, does contact tracing need to be to maintain epidemic control? It's worth saying here that actual immunity can only safely be obtained by vaccination. What we're talking about, rather, is sustained epidemic suppression. In other words, keeping the number of infections very low. So what, what we found is when we modelled conventional contact tracing, even if we made very ambitious assumptions about how quickly that could be done, uh, the virus would always sort of stay one step ahead. So that by the time you, you found people with the contact tracing teams, they would be substantially through their period of infectiousness. So where digital contact tracing changes that was this idea that you could, with an app, short circuit the process of contact tracing. And that sort of that gain of maybe one, two or even three days compared to, to what can be done with manual contact tracing would be enough that if you get that information and you act on it, that would be enough to, to, to reduce transmission. So to make sure contact tracing is effective, you need to be able to do it quickly and with a high proportion of the population which is why digital contact tracing is already a reality in many countries around the world, with admittedly varying degrees of success. And soon we'll be using this in the UK as well. So let's look at the technology. How does a contact tracing app work? You can set a phone to constantly be pinging out a beacon going, hi, I'm here, hi, I'm here, and to constantly be listening for similar beacons from other phones. Then you end up with a loose network of people who you've been in close contact with. What that means, in theory, is if any of those people learn later that they have had COVID and that they've been infectious for, say, four days, they can automatically warn every single person that they've come in contact with over the previous four days that they may have been exposed to COVID-19. The dream is that every single person they meet in the infectious period gets a warning because their, their phones work and the system works correctly, and then self-isolates and doesn't spread it onto everyone else. Obviously, it won't work perfectly. And so the two big questions that we have going forward are firstly, how well can this work? And secondly, what are the costs and trade-offs for trying it this way? These are massive questions. And in terms of trade-offs, one of the biggest issues is whether privacy concerns about the app's data collection will prevent the necessary uptake we need from the population. Because if people aren't using the app, then we have a problem. You have to download the app. If you don't download the app, you don't have the app and you're not contact tracing. After that, we start falling into, into the technical implementation. Things like whether or not the app stays running in the background, whether or not the app gets shut down to preserve power or to restore memory, whether or not the app automatically restarts if you restart your phone or if you have to remember to turn it on, whether or not your phone runs out of battery. These things will slice off a large chunk no matter how well it's done. So it's not perfect. And even if it was, not everybody has a smartphone. And some people have very old smartphones that wouldn't be new enough to run an app like this. There is one other potential weak link for even the best designed COVID app, which is you need to know you have COVID. This app is useless without a thorough testing regime, which we don't have. 
fundamentally, we, we don't yet have the scale of a testing infrastructure that would allow anyone to get a test if they think they have the symptoms. But it is a problem that needs to be solved before this contact tracing infrastructure can really start bringing down the number of transmissions and the number of infections. Contact tracing cannot work in isolation. Yes, it's important, but it's just one of the necessary measures we need to get right. To the extent that these apps will really work, they will work when they're integrated into a public health response with manual contact tracing, with the messaging around social distancing, with national testing programs as a package of measures that have a very clear aim. Stopping infections is a very difficult task. COVID is a, is a difficult infection to manage, but it's not an impossible one. Keeping the infection levels really low um, can be done. We don't know whether the government's strategy around contact tracing will work. A lot still remains to be seen. But there is this big lingering issue of privacy and the app. We want to hear what your concerns are, so leave them in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer them.